Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, yes, I will talk to you about uh, IMACA, which uh, some of you may know as a wide field GLAO demonstrator. And in fact, uh, we developed this really as a uh, test bench and demonstrator for all sorts of advanced diagnostics and control. So uh, <clears throat> this talk will focus on those. Uh, a lot of the work has been uh, done by uh, students, undergraduate and uh, graduate students. And so I will uh, go ahead. So for those who don't know, IMACA is a, a very wide field GLO demonstrator and development platform <clears throat> installed on the UH 2.2 meter telescope. Uh, originally, it was uh, really kind of thought as a, uh, an experiment to uh, push the limits of very wide field AO, both practically and theoretically. Uh, it's made up of five Shackhartman wavefront sensors with eight bytes of apertures, and it controls a 36 element bimorph mirror, which is on loan from Subaru from their first generation AO system. Uh, the wavefront sensors are on a fixed plate, so we have to physically move them uh, for a different constellation. And the patrol field is uh, almost 0.4 degrees. The science field, uh, where the uh, image quality is good, uh, is covered by a uh, monolithic 10,000 by 10,000 pixel detector, uh, which covers uh, 11 arc minutes. And we are eagerly awaiting the uh, <clears throat> integration of uh, Hawaii 4RG to get a uh, seven arc minute field, which uh, at least our simulations show that on a 2.2 meter telescope should be diffraction limited in H band over the whole field. Uh, we had first light in the fall of 2016 and did a bunch of GLAO characterization, uh, which have been published in uh, Abdurrahman's paper uh, of 2018, Fatima Abdurrahman. And uh, so today I will talk to you about some of our current developments, which include a predictor control to better separate the ground layer correction with fewer guide stars, uh, layer identification, uh, which can be used for the predictor, but also uh, important information on site monitoring. And finally, uh, last but not least, I should say, uh, work on an adaptive secondary mirror developed by TNO, uh, for which I've developed some uh, some interesting, or well, I think they're interesting tools. So the predictor control uh, is uh, Ryan Dungy's PhD work. Um, and here, really, the goal is to achieve better GLO correction using fewer guide stars, but being able to uh, reject the free atmosphere layers or any layer that we cannot correct uh, across the entire field. So we uh, call this temporal tomography. And <clears throat> um, uh, it's based on the predictive Fourier control that was developed by uh, Lisa uh, Poinier in 2007. And the idea is that uh, as it travels across the pupil, each Fourier mode uh, oscillates at a frequency which is determined by the frequency of the mode and the wind speed. And so um, this is why we can uh, more easily filter out temporal frequencies uh, that we identify as coming from the free atmosphere. So um, on this, uh, on these two plots on the left, you can see uh, the figure from uh, Lisa's paper in 2007, which had five layers, but used a high order wavefront sensor. Uh, and on the right, you see Ryan's results with two layers. Uh, so the red and blue dashed lines are where you expect the layers from simulation. And you can see uh, there is, we can see one of the layers, but not one, uh, the other one, not so well. And uh, this is really related to the resolution of our wavefront sensor. An 8 by 8 is simply not enough to, uh, to get good um, uh, measurements of these uh, Fourier modes. Uh, the next uh, bit of work uh, is work done by uh, Eden McEwen, who uh, is, uh, she did this um, as a research uh, experience as an undergraduate program at UH Hilo under Mark Chan. And um, the idea is to look at uh, covariance maps uh, to uh, identify layers uh, from the uh, open loop telemetry. Um, so the little movie here, uh, if I'm playing it, you can see one layer extract go very fast. So uh, first of all, I should say we see the auto covariance of two wavefront sensors, wavefront sensor one and uh, wavefront sensor zero. And then we see the cross covariance in the bottom right corner. So you can see the free atmosphere layer moving off right at the start of the movie uh, to the to the top. And you do not see that in the cross covariance because the cross covariance only sees the turbulence where the beams intersect. Um, we have a lot of data in open loop uh, that we gathered over the last two years, uh, and uh, we haven't yet done this analysis on uh, the pseudo open loop data, but we have four to five times more data in pseudo open loop. So here is an example of the results uh, that we can get. You can see at the top, 
um, the direction on the left and the, the speed on the right of the ground layer and at the bottom of the free atmosphere. So the ground layer, there is a 45 degree offset in the direction. The points are uh, higher than the dotted line, uh, but the speed is pretty well matched. Uh, whereas for the free atmosphere, uh, we get so, and so, okay, sorry, I should back up a little bit here. These are comparisons between our telemetry data and at the top, the uh, wind from the weather tower at CFHT, which is next to the UH-88 inch. And at the top, for, uh, at the bottom, uh, the free atmosphere is obtained from the GFS global circulation uh, meteorological model. And so there are some uncertainties there. Um, one is that uh, which altitude to take. Uh, Eden took the 350 millibar level. Um, and um, it turns out that in fact, some of the layers are uh, tagged as free atmosphere when really they should be ground layer. So uh, it's work in progress. Uh, part of the and uh, the problem is actually tracking, identifying and tracking those layers. Uh, so she's tried different algorithms, uh, you know, uh, the star finder algorithm, a radial method where she looks in an annulus and then the maximum peak. So in this little movie here, you can see the uh, maximum peak algorithm that is capable of, you know, identifying the, the layer, but, um, missing it at some iterations. Uh, so she's still working. There are still uh, issues on the background changing the, uh, in the cross correlations and uh, the, how do you filter the, this background by doing a rolling average and things like that. Okay, so um, that's uh, Eden's work. So now we come to the ASM. So um, uh, TNO in the Netherlands is developing a new uh, type of uh, actuators based on magnetic reluctance. And uh, these actuators have many advantages. They produce a strong force for low current. And <clears throat> uh, this allows, for example, the shell to be thicker. Uh, it can be rigidly supported. The uh, actuators are mechanically attached to it and can be spaced further apart. Uh, because of the low current, there's no need for cooling or uh, position feedback on the actuators. Um, and so this is a work in progress. At the bottom right, you can see some of the actuators that have been fabricated. The first batch, uh, three of them of the first batch that have been fabricated for the UH uh, adaptive secondary. The, the UH adaptive secondary prototype will have 211 actuators, and it measures about 60 centimeters diameter. Uh, so we will use it with the RoboAO uh, wavefront sensor, which is a 16 by 16, which allows to control this deformable mirror almost zonally. And then we'll have a modal control controlling uh, 64 modes with um, the Imaka wavefront sensors, although uh, there's still some uncertainty there because if we put the uh, Imaka wavefront sensors right at the F10 focus, uh, then we have 12 by 12 sub apertures. And because we're using the same constellations, we're kind of limited in terms of limiting magnitude. Uh, we may have to um, actually uh, uh, modify the, the wavefront sensors a little bit. Uh, this is still uh, being determined. Um, one of the issues, as you probably all know, with the uh, uh, convex um, adaptive secondary mirrors is how do you calibrate them? And uh, because usually you need um, some optics in front of it that is larger than the convex mirror uh, to be able to test it. So because we are doing this uh, on a prototype basis and uh, it's a research project, so we don't have a huge budgets, uh, we're going to use two methods to try to measure uh, the influence functions and the overall shape of the mirror. The first one uh, will be uh, partial illumination, actually, I have a slide here on this, uh, but I'm not going to talk about it very much. Basically, it's a Hindle sphere that eliminates parts of the pupil, and then you rotate the mirror and you do the test again. Uh, the other thing that we're going to try, and is quite interesting, are tests in deflectometry. So you can see the, the setup of a small prototype uh, at the bottom right. So you have uh, two big screens that will have a dot pattern on them, and then a camera in the middle looking at the uh, convex surface. and um, you can uh, basically, by looking at the movements of the spot, um, you can measure the, the displacement of the surface. 
It's very hard to def uh, calibrate diffractometry uh, in absolute terms. There's an uncertainty on the absolute surface error, but we want to use the diffractometry one to see like global features, uh, the functionality, the overall figure, and two, to measure the influence functions, which we will do uh, as uh, differential measurements. So uh, the uncertainty in the setup, for example, the camera location is taken out, but we will still probably use a 3D scanner to be able to position the camera at least relatively accurately at the beginning. Um, also, uh, we will have some capacitive sensors at the back of the surface, uh, so we can measure the uh, absolute displacement of the shell, uh, which we can then uh, use to calibrate the deflectometry uh, displacement in absolute terms. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, final thing that uh, I want to talk about um, is a method which I uh, developed to uh, measure interaction matrices on sky in the presence of turbulence, which I call dynamic on sky covariance random interaction matrix estimation. And um, the idea is uh, quite uh, quite simple. You uh, apply small uh, random commands on the deformable mirror in open or closed loop on sky. You record the wavefront tensor measurements, and then you can improve the measurements by uh, filtering uh, high pass in temporally to remove most of the turbulence. Uh, one of the advantages of using this method is that you're measuring the interaction matrices in exactly the same conditions as the uh, system will be used. So all the dynamic effects are taken into account, or if there is some netting or pupil distortion or things like that. And uh, we have actually tested this with the current Yamaka system, which has an entrance focus where we can put an artificial source. And so we can do a direct comparison of the you know, traditional poke uh, matrix method with the do crime method. Uh, so here is just the, the math, it's really basic. Uh, you write that the measurements are equal to the interaction matrix times the commands. The, this commands of psi of t are your known random uh, commands that you apply to the formal mirror. And what you're recording is just the measurements, m, which are made up of the response to your stimulus plus the atmosphere, ma. Multiply both sides by c psi, the transpose, and take the time average. And you see that the uh, measurements, the covariance of the measurements of the atmosphere with your random commands goes to zero. And so you're left with your interaction matrix being uh, the product of these two uh, covariance matrices. And, and because you have chosen those seek psi to be random, their covariance is diagonal. And so the uh, inversion is trivial. Uh, so I've run a bunch of simulations to try the method. Uh, I'm not gonna go into all the details, uh, but basically uh, on the top row are open loop simulation and the bottom row are closed loop simulation. Uh, in the closed loop simulation, you see that in the presence of noise up to magnitude nine and 10, when you do, uh, you, you get the same variance attenuation with our do crime matrices as you do with the poke matrices, which is here at point two. Um, when you do it in closed loop, obviously you're modulating on the deformable mirror. So that's a, this has an effect on the PSF, on the science PSF. And so the dotted line, the thick dotted line is the strail attenuation as a function of the modulation amplitude. So you can see that if you can tolerate a strail drop of about 50%, like you would, for example, in GLAO where it's not that critical, then you can have this running in real time in the background and measuring your, your interaction matrices constantly. Uh, but for SCAO and uh, for extreme AO, it's not adequate because it, it decreases it uh, decreases the performance uh, if the drop in strill uh, has to be small. And uh, <clears throat> lastly, I will show some results on sky. So uh, on the left, you see five different sequences where we tried, so black is uh, the open loop seeing, Red is the poke matrices, and green and blue are two different uh, modulation patterns on the on the deformable mirror. And you can see that sometimes uh, the do crime works a little bit better than the poke matrices. Other times uh, it doesn't. And when you plot it on a histogram, uh, which is here on the right, you see that uh, within the noise uh, they perform exactly the same. Um, and so we're pretty happy that uh, once we receive the adaptive secondary mirror, at least we have a method that we know that we can close uh, the loop on sky and get, uh, get performance immediately. So to conclude, uh, I have presented some predictor controller work uh, developed by Ryan Dungy at UH, uh, Eden McEwen's work on the covariance maps uh, used to identify layers automatically, their speed and direction. 
the TNO adaptive secondary mirror that is going to be integrated uh, in early 2021 in the Netherlands, hopefully will have first light by next summer uh, at the UH 88 inch. And uh, for that, we have developed a bespoke uh, interaction matrix uh, on sky uh, method that works in open and closed loop. And all this uh, is uh, preparing for a uh, potential ASN for CAC. Uh, and uh, if they do go for an ASM, then a GLAO mode. And so uh, with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Olivia. Um, a lot of work that's gone into that system. Really nice to see the nice results coming out of it. And um, so just on to the, go straight into the questions. We've got one from um, Gilles. Um, can you comment more on the motivation for predictive control for GLAO? How much do you expect to improve the anisoplanetism over the field of view? Well, um, the idea really is to be able to do GLAO with fewer guide stars, right? Uh, the field of view is, I don't think is going to be, because the field of view is really determined by the thickness of the layer, the gray zone, you know, the Tocqueville and gray zone. And so once, you've, once you're once you within that gray zone, uh, the field of view, I mean, I, what we found at Mauna Kea was that the field of view was so small, sorry, the thickness of the layer was so small that the corrected field could be huge, it could be degree. And uh, we just don't have the optics or the detectors to cover that. Uh, but but uh, on the other hand, conversely, uh, the, the constraints that come from needing numerous guide stars because the residual error decreases as one of the square root of the number of guide stars, uh, you know, because of the limiting magnitudes, uh, you can have a lot more sky coverage if you can use fewer guide stars. So the motivation is to be able to demonstrate that we get the same performance with three guide stars with a temporal predictor than we would with the five guide stars in the just simple averaging mode. And this is useful work also for uh, GMT, which will have three guide stars uh, for its GLAO, right? Um, so uh, that, that's the motivation uh, behind the predictor work. Okay. Um, I think there are a couple of comments that you might want to chat, that, that people might chat. So if you have a look in the, uh, a look in the comments after, yeah, I think there's I a couple of comments in there. I will um, do that. So, I mean, you mentioned on the final, on the final slide there that there was um, the status of the, the ASM. Um, it's, you're expecting it next year, assuming everything could be shipped and travel and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I was, I was just wondering, with that with the ASM and the GLAO system, I mean, you've got such a wide field of view. I mean, how much does the how much does the illumination on the ASM change across the field of view in the system? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, so we have to take that into account. In fact, uh, when we will use the ASM in uh, SCAO mode with RoboAO, the outer ring of actuators will not be used at all. And so uh, we need that outer ring only for the GLAO. Uh, there's some issues too, because there's some slumping on the uh, edges. Uh, you know, we, we're slumping the surface. And so there's going to be a little rebound at the edge. So, uh, you know, all these things, I think, I mean, we, we're developing this hand in hand with TNO. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a prototype, and we're really trying to get it on Sky to demonstrate that uh, these new actuators, you know, are totally fine to use uh, in in the in the field. Okay, thank you. And then one last question from Michel Talon: um, How do you merge the data of the wavefront sensors? Do you use any priors? Sorry, can you repeat the question? How do you merge the data of the wavefront sensor wavefront sensors? Do you use ah. any priors? Right. So at the uh, for at the time being, we don't. Uh, we uh, we average them. Uh, we have tried putting a um, a weighting scheme, but uh, really it doesn't doesn't help that much. Uh, so there is a lot we could do to improve the the GLAO over the simple averaging, uh, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but we at the at the moment we don't really. Okay. But I'll, I'm willing to take any uh, any input from Michel on how to do that. <laughs> Okay, so we do have a couple of, we, we do have a discussion session now, which means that we can handle one more question for you. You're in the hot seat, unfortunately. You've got the extended questions. Um, so one here from Carlos. Um, how does your interaction matrix estimation compare to the covariance based method from Bechet et al, SPIE 2020, uh, 2012? Um, I don't know if you knew about. 
I, I don't know. I, I looked up a, a bunch of other methods. Uh, people have done, uh, you know, uh, modal excitation at a known frequency, and uh, there was another one. Uh, uh, but I, I don't know. Uh, it, actually, maybe Carlos can uh, can. Well, maybe I can take this offline with him, but I'm I'm not familiar with it. Oh no, I mean we can we can move into the discussion session now if Carlos wants to jump in and say something. I can. Um... No, I cannot judge from what you just presented, but um, you know, kind of my my recollection of of this uh, um, Clementine Boucher, which was basically looking at the closed loop uh, increments on the on the um, uh, commands, right, and then computing covariance matrices, and then doing a bunch of math on top of that, and basically extracting um, re linear relationships between covariance matrices, which ended up being the interaction matrix. Um, there's probably someone in the audience that can explain this better than I do. Um, and by looking at what you just presented, kind of, uh, you know, linked back to that, like, okay, there might be some, some I don't know, overlap or, or some similarities. Um, just wanted to uh, bring that to your attention. Right. Well, thanks. I will look up her paper. Um, do you know what uh, pattern was applied? Because I tried a couple of things. You know, there is the uh, Hadamar method that was uh, developed by Serge Memon uh, and, and uh, collaborators. And I tried using the Hadamar in my commands. And the problem is that a uh, Hadamar has, uh, uh, you, you can't invert the covariance of a Hadamar matrix because it's, you know, it's completely degenerate in a way because each Hadamar vector uh, is, is orthogonal to all the others. Anyway, uh, so it, I'd be interested to see what the actuation pattern is. I found that using small random, randomly, uh, you know, uniformly uh, distributed random commands uh, work best, but um, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and Joan is, is commenting uh, real time, and I, I think as well that, that yeah, so in, the, in, in Clementine's, uh, Clementine Boucher's paper, uh, they they close the loop right, and they and they collect the uh, the, uh, the the commands um, and eventually the uh, the the wavefront sensor um, uh, slopes over time, and then they kind of correlate uh, back to back and flesh out the interaction matrix. In which case, then it's different from what you're doing because you're applying a pattern, right? Um, right. Anyway, just thought that um, you know there might be some some um, room for yeah. you know. So one of the neat things with this method is that uh, uh, in just four seconds. You can get a, on sky in open loop. You can get an interaction matrix. So because you're applying a known disturbance, you know you don't you don't have to wait for um, uh, the atmosphere to excite all the all the modes and for it to converge slowly. It, this converges really quickly uh, when there's no noise. Uh, noise is a problem. It doesn't work very well on bright stars because on the covariance, the noise is on the diagonal too, so you can't extract the noise from it. But anyway, it's. Um, uh, for me, it was important that we could close the loop when we get the ASM, you know. <laughs> that was the main motivation. Thanks. Okay. So we're officially into a, a little discussion session now. So uh, I think, um, thanks, Olivia, again for, for your talk.